Welcome, welcome. We are now ready for lesson 11 points on the coordinate plane. Now, the coordinate plane is something we learned about in fifth grade, so hopefully we remember plotting points on this. Let's review for just a second because our very first activity is actually a game. You're gonna wanna find a partner and play this game. Have you ever played Battleship? Where you, you try to hit somebody else's ships on a grid like this? That's exactly what you're gonna be doing here, okay? So what you're going to be doing, like it says, you're going to start out by setting up your the ship that you want, you don't want sunk. So this is the secret part. Okay, so you're going to pick either a horizontal or a vertical line on the grid. And you're going to draw four points on that line. Okay, so I'm just going to randomly pick four points. They don't have to be right next to each other, but they can be. Okay, they don't have to be. So there's four points. See how they're all on the same vertical line? That is gonna constitute my ship, okay? So pretend this is a ship right here, like in the ocean, okay, like battleship, okay? So there's my ship and those four points, if somebody strikes those four points, they're gonna sink my ship, okay? Now your partner is gonna do the same thing secretly on a different grid. Now you're gonna have to, one of you will have your workbook Maybe the other person should trace the workbook on a lined piece of paper or something, or you could go ahead and print this from Canvas so that the other person has a copy as well. But the other person's gonna want a copy of this and they're gonna make up their own location of their own ship. And you should not share this with, with each other. This should be secret, right? So maybe their ship is over here going this way, or maybe their ship is over here going this way. Whatever, it doesn't matter where you put it as long as it's either vertical or horizontal. You just can't go diagonal, okay? So once you've got your four points, you also need to label each point with its coordinates. And this is what I wanted to review really quickly. Do we remember how to label and name the points on the grid? Okay, the first thing to remember is that the horizontal number line on a coordinate plane is the x-axis, and the vertical number line on a coordinate plane is the y-axis. Whoa, okay? Now, it's important to remember those because when we name an ordered pair, we always do the X number first followed by the Y number. So it's always the X axis number first followed by the Y axis number, okay? For example, this point right here would be a nine first because that's the X axis number and then one because that's the Y axis number, okay? Now this point up here would be again nine, but this time the second number would be four. And then the third number up here would again be nine first, because again, these are all in a vertical line. They're gonna have the same X number, but then my Y is going to be seven. And my last one up here is gonna be again nine first followed by eight, okay? So now I have labeled all four of my points. Now you're gonna to wanna to do that and your partner is gonna to wanna to do that. Now you can just follow the instructions on this. Basically you're gonna take point, take turns naming coordinate points. You don't know where your partner's ship is, but you're trying to sink their ship by hitting these four points, right? So for example, I might say to my partner, um, how about five, four? and they're gonna say, miss. So I know that their ship is not right there. And then when it's my turn again, I might say, 210. That would be 210. And then they might say, oh no, you hit my boat. And you would know that is where their boat is. Does that make sense? Now, here's another rule that it mentions in the instructions. Oh, it says if you guess correct, put an X. Okay, so if you get correct, then you put an X. If your partner gets the point that is on your, uh, it doesn't say what to do if it's not, but I think you should somehow mark it if it's not so that you know what you've already guessed. Does that make sense? Somehow mark it when it's not right so that you don't keep guessing the same points. But here's what I was gonna say earlier. If the point is on the line, but not one of the points, for example, if somebody says nine, five, that's on my line, but it's not one of my four points, okay? So you have to tell them, that point is on my line, but it's not one of my points. It's not gonna kill my, it's not gonna sink my ship, right? 
So basically you go back and forth, each person giving an ordered pair, and the first person to sink their partner's ship wins the game, just like in the game Battleship, okay? So that's your first activity for this. I want you to go find somebody to play this with. Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your little brother, maybe it's your older sister. I don't care who it is. Find someone and beg them to play with you so that you get some good practice on ordered pairs, okay? So that's the first activity. Go and do that. Pause this video and go and do that real quick. All right, hopefully we have played the game and we are all practiced up on the coordinate grid and we're ready to go for this next part. You'll notice this grid looks a little bit different in activity number two. The first thing we're going to do is label each point on the grid, the coordinate plane with that ordered pair. So just as a review, the first number is the X coordinate, the second number is a Y coordinate, the horizontal axis is the X axis, so that's the number we're gonna do first, and the vertical number line axis is the Y axis, so that's the second number in our ordered pair, okay? So let's start with point A. Point A is at, first we go to the X coordinate, that's this way. So I'm gonna go over to, it looks like it's lined up with the three. So three is first, I'm just gonna label it up here. Maybe I'll do it down here as well. So three is the first one, but then I have to go to the Y number. The number on the Y axis is four. So A is at three, four, okay? Now we're ready for point B. Point B is over here. This time when I go to the X axis, where does that go? Well, this time it goes over to negative four. This is what's new this year. Now we have a negative part of our axis showing, okay? So B is at negative four. And then if we go to our Y axis, it's lined up with the two. So negative four, two is the coordinate for point B. Okay, so far are we good? Let's go on to point C, which is down here. Again, our X coordinate is first. So on the X axis, we find what it lines up with and it lines up with negative five. So negative five is the first number for our ordered pair. And then we go to the Y axis, which it lines up with negative three. You see how we're down below zero? So it's a negative three for my Y coordinate, okay? Last one is point D over here. So again, X coordinate first. So we're here at four. So this one's a positive four. And then for my Y coordinate, I go over to the vertical axis and that's a negative two. So for point D, we're at four, negative two. And there they all are. Okay, we've labeled each of the four points with their ordered pair. Okay, number two, what do you notice about the locations of ordered pairs B, C, and D? How are they different from those for point A? Well, the first thing I noticed as we were doing this is that A, both numbers were positive, right? We went over to positive three to the right and then up to positive four on the y-axis. Those were both positive. But as soon as we got to B, all of a sudden I was going left, which is negative, and then up. So B had a negative coordinate. C went left, so that was negative, and it went down, so that was negative again. So C had two negatives, and then D, while it went positive at first, it went down second, so that was another negative coordinate. So how are they different? They all have negative coordinates. Okay, so that's how they're different this year. Plot a point at negative two, five and label it E. Okay, so when we plot a point, we always start at zero, zero, right at the center of our two axes, right? So we're gonna start at negative, or at zero, zero. And I have to first go to negative two. Now remember, that negative two has to be on my horizontal x-axis. So I go to negative two. There it is right there. And then on my y-axis, I have to go up to five. So where does negative two meet with five? There it is right there. 
And that is what I'm going to label point E, okay, at negative 2, positive 5. That's point E, okay? Next one, we're going to plot 3, negative 4.5 and label it F. Well, that's tricky. That's a decimal. Let's see if we can figure out where that goes. So again, I'm going to start at 0, 0, and then I'm going to go to positive 3. Again, my x-axis is first. So positive 3 is right over here. And then I have to go to negative 4.5 or negative 4 and 1 half. So I have to go down, right? So down to negative 4 and 1 half. So that's halfway to 5. Does that make sense to everybody? So my dot is going to be right there, halfway between negative 4 and negative 5 on the 3 line. Okay? So this is point F at 3, negative 4.5. There's where F is. Okay? So now we're done with number 3 in activity 2. Very, very good job. Number 4. We have a new vocabulary word in number 4. It says the coordinate plane is divided into 4 quadrants. You say that word quadrants. 1, 2, 3, and 4. We use Roman numerals for the names of the quadrant. So that's like an I, an II, an III, and an IV, right? I like to top them off. You don't have to, but you'll see when I draw the Roman numerals, I always top them and put the top and bottoms on there just to make it easier to tell what numbers they are, okay? Now, the other thing we need to know about these quadrants is that they do matter which one's which, okay? They always are in this position. Quadrant one is always this top right-hand side of the coordinate plane. Then we go like a C. We go around to quadrant two, this direction, and then to quadrant three, and then to quadrant four. See how we just made like a capital C as we went around? That's how they go. Quadrant one, two, three, and four. The other important things to know about the quadrants, and this is a kind of a hint for what we're going to do in just a little bit, Notice how quadrant one, if I look at this number line, right now it's, it's naked, right? We haven't labeled this yet. But we know that if I'm going to the right on a horizontal number line, these are all positive numbers, aren't they? Right? And if I go up on a vertical number line, these are all positive. Right? So no matter where I land in quadrant one, both of my numbers are going to be positive, okay? But when I get over to quadrant two, now I have to go left to get into quadrant two. These are the negative numbers on the x-axis. Right? So in quadrant two, my x-coordinate is gonna be negative. But then when I go up into this space, it's a positive again because I'm going up on the y-axis, so that's a positive, okay? In quadrant C, I have to go left, so that's negative, and I have to go down. These are also negative. Whoops, negative two, negative three, negative four, I'm squishy. Negative five, negative six, so these are both negative in quadrant three, okay? And in quadrant four, I have to go to the right, which is positive, but then I have to go down, which is negative, okay? So those are just really great things to stick in your notes, and you'll see why in just a little bit and how that will really help us identify the quadrants, okay? Part A of number four says, in which quadrant is G located? Well, here's point G right here. Now, I could take the time to actually plot that, or I could just look at the signs. These are both positive numbers. So what quadrant does it have to be in if both of them are positive? There it is right there. If both of them are positive, the only one that has both of them positive is quadrant one. So G is located in quadrant one. Okay. Now, where is H? Lo and let's plot that just to be, let's just practice. If I'm going to plot 5, 2, then I go to the right 5 and up 2. So there is point G right there. And it is, in fact, in quadrant 1. Okay? 
point H now. Point H, I have a negative one and a negative five. So which quadrant has a negative in both spots? Well, these are both positive. That's positive and negative. Oh, there it is right there. Both of them negative is in quadrant three. So H, we already know, is in quadrant three, okay? Let's plot it just to make sure. Negative one on the x-axis and then negative five. So left one and down five is gonna put point H right there. And in fact, it is in quadrant four, okay? Last one, point I, I'm gonna have to move it clear over here. Point I, is it positive seven, negative four? Now order does matter. Which quadrant has positive first and then negative second? Positive first and then negative second is quadrant four. So this is going to be in quadrant, whoops, not four, but IV, okay? And it is important to name them with the Roman numerals or else they're not correct. It is quadrant four IV, okay? So let's plot that one. We're gonna go to the right seven and then down four. And it's right where I was writing before. So let's see here. Yep, about right there is point I, okay? So now we have finished part A of number four. Part B. A point has a positive y coordinate, which quadrant could it be? If it has a positive y coordinate, remember x is first and y is second. So we're looking for a positive in the y coordinate. So it could be in quadrant one. It could be in quadrant one. Positive y, it could be in quadrant two. Could it be in three? Nope, because the y coordinate is negative in quadrant three. Could it be in four? Nope, because the y coordinate is negative in quadrant four. So the only options is that it can be in quadrants one and two if the y coordinate is positive. Okay? Ready to move on to activity number three. And once again, activity number three is super fun. It's kind of like a game here, except it's a, a game of darts. Okay, here is an image of an archery target on the coordinate plane. So see how there's the coordinate plane hidden behind here? And then we have an archery target in the middle, okay? The scores for landing an arrow in the colored regions are shown. Here they are. If I land in the yellow, which these are black and white, we can't tell which ones are which. I may have to go to my computer and tell you which ones are which, huh? Because mine are black and white. I hope yours are in color but mine are not, so I'm gonna to have to flip over here and see. I'm almost there, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Good thing I have my computer close by. All right. Yellow looks like it's in the middle. I'm gonna put a Y in the middle for yellow. And then red is next door. Okay, so these are in order. So red is the first layer, and then blue, I'm gonna put a blue in that layer, and then green, that's the third layer, and then white is this white space, of course, between the green and the line. There's the outer edge of our target, okay? Okay, so again, yellow is in the middle, and then red, blue, green, white, just in case yours is in black and white like mine is, okay? So if I hit it in the yellow, the bullseye, I get 10 points. If I hit it in the red area, which goes all the way around, right? If I hit it anywhere in the red, I get eight points. Anywhere in the blue, I get six points. Anywhere in the green, I get four points. And anywhere in the white, I get two points. And if you totally miss the target, of course, then I guess you get zero points, right? Okay, so it says name the coordinates for a possible landing point to score, number one, six points. So in order to score six points, I have to land in the blue, right? So I have to land somewhere on this circle. So there's lots of possible points in this range, aren't there? But I have to land on something that will get me six points. So let's find a perfect landing point. There's one right there. See how I that point right there where those two grid marks intersect? 
That point right there will land in the blue, which will give me six points. So let's write the coordinate point, the coordinate ordered pair for that point. If I start at zero, zero, I have to go left to negative three, so that's first. And then I have to go down to negative two. So there's a possible point that will get me six points. Let's do one more just for fun. If I need to land in the blue, it can be anywhere. It can even be over on this side. What if I were to do this one? Where would that one be? Well, I have to go to negative six. And then I have to go down to, ne oh, that's also negative six. So negative six, negative six will also give me six points. Now you don't have to do two for each of these. I just decided to do two for the first one just to show us, okay? For number three, where would I have to land to get two points? Well, two points is in the white. So anywhere in the white will give us two points. So again, you don't have to have my exact same answer, but it does need to be within this white ring around the very outside of my bullseye here. So I'm gonna pick, how about this one over here? This one looks good. Where is that one? Well, I have to start at zero and go left to negative seven. And then down to, where was that? Negative eight. So negative seven, negative eight is a good one to earn two points. It's not the only one. I could have landed here, I could have landed here, I could have landed here, right? Any of those points that give me a good hole in the white range works, okay? How about four points? I'm kind of going out of order here, but that's okay. Four points is green. Where would I have to land to hit the green? Let's see, the green is this one right here. So it's the third layer. Where's a good point in the green? Oh, I see one right there. Let's do that one. Again, I'm looking for these intersections, right? That are land in the green. So that's actually three in a row right there. There's another good one right there, but let's just do this one. So again, I have to go left to negative eight and then down to negative three. So negative eight, negative three is a good landing point for the green, okay? Number two, in order to get 10 points, I have to land inside the yellow bullseye. There's really only two good points in the yellow bullseye, so I don't care which one you pick. Let's just pick this one. Where is that one? Well, I have to go negative four first and then negative four second. That one was lucky. It was both negative four. Left four and down four. Okay. Zero points. No points. Well... If I hit within the bullseye itself, I at least get two points. So anywhere outside of here would give me no points. So let's just pick one that's outside our graph. I picked this one over here. Did you have to pick that one? Absolutely not. You could pick this one, you could have picked this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, right? Anything outside our bullseye. But let's name this one. To get to this point, I have to go to positive three first. And then I have to go down to negative six. So there's mine, okay? Now, in order to earn eight points, where would my arrow have to go? Well, eight points is in the red. So that's this first layer right here. Can we see a good point within the red? Hmm, there's one right there. There's one right there. Let's do this one right here. That looks like a good one, right in the middle of the red. Can you see where I am right there? It's kind of hard to see my pencil on this bullseye, but it's right there, okay? So first we go to the X coordinate, which is negative six. So left six and then down to negative four is what lines up with that one, negative four. So there we are. We are done with numbers one through six in activity three. We named all those ordered pairs. Now again, your answers do not have to match mine. In fact, I hope they don't. I hope they are different from mine, but they follow the rules of landing in those different zones that we need, okay? Awesome. Guess what? That's our last activity for today. The only thing we have left is our Are You Ready For More? And this is a really good, fun game to play with yourself. See if you can figure out on the coordinate plane how to obey all these rules and how many steps you can take. I really like this one. But again, like always, this one is optional. So you can choose whether or not you want to try that challenge problem. 
Okay. We'll take both of those out of our way. Here's our summary page. If you're not sure how to plot points, make sure you read this page. There's lots of resources to help you understand how to plot points. So if you don't quite remember this from fifth grade, that's okay. Just keep practicing. And maybe I'll even throw in an extra practice worksheet. I think I will. One of those fun art projecty ones where you draw a picture with the points. I might just do that. I've got lots of those. I'll go ahead and enter, uh, put that in Canvas as well so you can have that to practice with. There is our one vocabulary word today, quadrant. Remember, there are four. Do you remember which ones they are? It starts like a C, right? So quadrant one is this corner, this fourth of the corner grid. And then we go to the left for quadrant two, and then down to quadrant three, and then all the way around to the left side, to the back to the right side, and a big C for quadrant four. Okay, so quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. That's our vocabulary word for the day. Okay, now we are ready for our practice problems. So go ahead and pause this video. Go and give those practice problems your very best effort. And I know you will because... Do your best because you deserve your best. All right, we are now ready to get our homework done for lesson 11, practice problems. Um, first, the first thing I wanna to mention today is for number one, it asks us to graph a bunch of points in the coordinate plane, but it doesn't actually give us a graph to do that on. So in Canvas, I do have a piece of graph paper that you can print from Canvas if you would like it. I'm just gonna draw my own right here, and I'll show you how to do that. If you'd like to just do that, or if you've already done that, that is just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's good practice. But if you're kinda like me, I would prefer to have a grid, then, then go ahead and print that, and you can use that, okay? Or if you happen to have graph paper at home, that'd be fine as well, okay? So let's dive into number one. Like I said before, we need to graph these points. We have a bunch of them here. So the first thing we need to do is draw our coordinate grid so that we can work on that. Now, as we know, a coordinate grid has a vertical number line. That's our Y axis. And it has a horizontal number line. That's our X axis. So I'm gonna label those just to help us remember. Then we also need to label the points. Now notice our points are not very big, right? They're twos and threes. So I don't need to make a million little tick marks. I just need maybe four in each direction. That should be plenty, right? This is part of the reason I didn't worry so much about having to draw it myself because it's not very big, okay? But I do want to label one, two, three, four, whoops. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. One, two, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and one, two, three, four. That'll just help us when we get to plotting our points. Okay, now we, oh, and then don't forget, the middle, of course, is zero, zero, right? Okay, graph these points. Here we go. Negative two, comma, positive three. Okay, so again, we're going to start at zero. We're going to go to negative two on the x-axis. And then to positive three on the y-axis, so there's our point right there at negative two, positive three. There's our first point. I wish they had told us what to label these. I'm gonna label that one A. I think it's always a good idea to put letters next to our point so that we can identify them later, okay? Our next one is a positive two, positive three. So very similar, but now we're going to positive two first instead of negative two first. So we're gonna to go to positive two, and then up one, two, three. So there's where my second point lives, and I'm gonna label this one B, okay? My next one is at negative two, negative three. Negative two, negative three. Okay, so starting at zero, I'm gonna to go to negative two on the x-axis first, and then this time I have to go down to negative three on the y-axis. So now I'm clear down here for my next point, which I am gonna call C. I'm gonna rebel a little bit and label these, okay? And then our last one is at positive two and negative three. So I'm gonna to go to positive two on the x-axis first, 
and then down to negative 3 on the y-axis. So there's my last point. And this is point D. I'm going to label that point D. Okay? So part A is now done. We've labeled and located all four of my points. It's done. Connect all of the points. Oh, what it means here is to connect them with a line. So we're just going to go A, B, C, and D. We're going to connect these all with a line and turn it into a shape. Describe the figure. What did we just make? Well, we made a rectangle. That is a rectangle. Very, very good. Now for number two. Write the coordinates of each point. Now we could label them right on the graph or we could do them off to the side. I like to do them off to the side because the graph gets really squishy if there's too much going on, right? So I'm going to label A, B, C. How many are there? A, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to put each of those coordinate pairs, coordinate or ordered pairs over here on the side. So let's do point A first. Here's point A. Okay. We need to be super careful about this grid because notice each of these grid marks is labeled 2, 4, 6, 8. So there's actually a hidden grid mark in here at 1, isn't there? So A is actually at 1, comma. Now we didn't go up the y-axis at all. We didn't go down y-axis at all. So where is it on the y-axis? It's at 0. So 1, 0 is point A. See how that works? Now point B is down here. Again, we're counting by twos. So halfway between negative two and negative four would be, oh, but wait a second. I can't go down first. I have to go to the X first. Did I move it all to the X? Nope, that was zero. It's on the zero of the X axis. And now I go down to negative three on the Y axis. Halfway between negative two and negative four is negative three. So there's point B. Point C is clear over here in quadrant two. So to get there, if I start at zero on the x-axis, I have to go to negative six first. And then I have to go up to two, four, halfway between four and six is where five lives. So that is at negative six, five. Awesome. Now for D. D is clear down here in the middle of my square here. So let's see if we can figure this out. If I start at zero, I have to go left to, not quite to four, to negative three. So I have to go to negative three first, and then I have to go down to four, not quite to six, but to negative five. So there's point D. Last one is point E. Where is point E? Oh, here it is, right here. Point E is hidden, huh, okay. So starting at zero, I'm not going to go all the way to negative two. That would be too far, but I do go to negative one. So that's my first coordinate, negative one, and then up to four. It's right exactly at four. So negative one, four is point E. Okay, good. Now we've done all of number two. I hope we got all those right. Give yourselves a pat on the back if you did. That's awesome. Number three. These three points form a horizontal line. Name two additional points that fall on this same line. Okay, so how do we know these are all on the same line? Well, let's take a look at this. We've got negative 3.5 comma 4, 0, 4, and 6.24. Well, what did you notice? 4, 4, 4. So if I were to plot those, I would go left negative 3.5 up 4. Then I would go right or left 0 up 4 right 6.2 and, and then up 4. So every time I had to go up 4. So that's the hint. This is going to be a horizontal line up here at 4, isn't it? See how that works? So what other point would be on that line? Well, anything that has a 4 as a y coordinate would be on the same line, right? Just like remember when we did that battleship in our lesson? Everything that had the same coordinate would be on that same line, wouldn't it? All right, so let's just, how many do we have to name? We have to name two more. So anything, we've got negative three and a half, zero, and 6.2. We don't have a five, so there's one. How about 
negative 10, 4. There's another one. How about 2.8, 4, right? Literally anything could be in there. In fact, could I even do a fraction? Yes, I could. So I've actually named way more than I needed to, but literally any number in that X coordinate would be just fine. Positive, negative, fraction, decimal, whatever, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that the four is my Y coordinate because that's what puts it on the same line as these three points, okay? Now, moving on to number four. Now, I noticed when I printed these out that for some stupid reason, it put part D of number four on the next page. And I hate it when it does this, especially when it's multiple choice. <laughs> but I can't forget about D as one of my options here. So hopefully we can see all of those. One night, it is 24 degrees Celsius warmer in Tucson than it was in Minneapolis. If the temperatures in Tucson and Minneapolis are opposites, what is the temperature in Tucson? Okay, let's make sure we understand what it's saying because this is tempting to me to say, oh, the opposite of negative 24 is, I mean, a positive 24 is negative 24 done. But be careful because it says one night it is 24 degrees warmer in Tucson than it is in Minneapolis. So this is the total distance between Tucson and Minneapolis. In other words, if this is a thermometer, right, this is a thermometer. We'll pretend this is a thermometer. And we have Tucson up here. It is 24 degrees warmer than Minneapolis down here. So this distance here is 24 degrees. But that doesn't mean that these two numbers are opposites or else they would actually be way farther apart. So if they are opposites, If the temperatures of Tucson and Minneapolis are opposites, what must be in the middle? Zero degrees, right? Because opposites have to be on one side or the other of zero. So if Tucson and Minneapolis are on, on opposite sides of zero and they're 24 units apart from each other, the Tucson must be at 12 degrees Fahrenheit and Minneapolis must be at negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit because 12 plus 12 is 24. Oh my goodness, that was so tricky. So that means the actual temperature in Tucson was 12 degrees Celsius and the actual temperature in Minneapolis was negative 12. So which one is it asking us for? What is the temperature in Tucson? So the answer is positive 12, it's C. Oh my goodness, did any of you get stumped by that one? That was a tricky one, but the answer is C, okay? Good, 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 number five. Noah is helping his band sell boxes of chocolate to uh, fund a field trip. Each box contains 20 bars and each bar sells for $1.50. Complete the table for values of M, okay. So this is the number of boxes sold. So if I sell one box, how many actual candy bars did I sell? Well, I sold 20 bars, right? Does that make sense? Because each box has 20 candy bars in it and each candy bar is $1.50. So for one box, I have to do 20 candy bars times $1.50 each so 20 times one, of course, is 20, plus half again more is 10. So I'm gonna earn $30 for selling one box of candy. Now, did everybody understand how I did that? Literally, I did 20 candy bars times, whoops, I don't need to, I gotta line up the digits here, times 1.5. Right, so that's zero, that's 10. And that's zero, okay, now that's zero, and that's two, so 300, but then there's one decimal point, $30. There's my answer. Now, once I know how much one box costs, though, here's where it gets easier. If one box collects $30, how much would two boxes collect? 
two times $30 or $60. How much would three boxes collect? $90. Four boxes, $120, right? Five boxes, $150. Six boxes, $180. See how it's just $30 per box? So 30 times six is 180. 30 times seven, $210. And 30 times eight is $240. Good. Done with part A of number five. I hope I got all of that on screen. We finished the table. Now let's answer some questions. It says write an equation for the amount of money M that will be collected if B boxes of chocolate bars are sold. Well, we know that there are 20, bo 20 candy bars per box. So 20 times B, right? is going to give us the amount of money M. Well, actually 20 is the number of candy bars, but how much money, M is the money earned. So we actually need our money earned per box. So it's actually $30 per box equals the amount of money we're gonna earn. Does that make sense? So $30 per box or times the number of boxes equals M. Well, that was what we did here. $30 times one, $30. $30 times two is $60. $30 times three is $90, right? That's exactly what we did, okay? But we're not done with part B. It says, which is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable? Remember, the independent variable is the result of the math, right? It's the answer to the math. So the answer to the math is M, okay? So the independent is the variable M. That means the dependent variable, the one doing all the math, that's B, okay? All right, now for part C, it says to write an equation for the number of boxes B that were sold if M dollars were collected. So this time, actually, did you notice what they did? They switched the order of our variables. So let's gonna change our equation, right? Now we want the M dollars to be doing all the math because that's the one we know. This time it's the number of boxes that we don't know. So let's switch this around. If I switch the M and the B in my equation, I also have to switch the math that's being ha happening here, right? So right now I have multiplication, but if I switch, I'm gonna have to do division. So now this is gonna be M divided by 30 equals B. See how that works? Now the money sold divided by $30 equals the number of boxes that were sold. Does that still work? Well, let's try it. If I earned $150 and I divide that by $30 per box, I must have sold five boxes. 150 divided by 30 is five. That works. Let's try another one, 210. If I do 210 divided by 30, that would equal seven boxes. So there's my double check. I know I got the right equation. But by doing this, I changed which variable was independent and which variable was dependent. Now that M is doing all the math, M is now the dependent variable. And now that B is the answer or the results to the math, now B is the independent variable. See how those swapped places? simply by swapping the equation, right? This is review from a while ago. I'm glad you're remembering this stuff. Number six, and you know what? It did it again on number six, I was noticing. Number six, part B is on the very next page here. So don't let me forget part B. Let me get this other page out of my way here. Lynn ran 29 meters in 10 seconds. She ran at a constant speed. How far did Lynn run every second? So how far, that's distance, did she run every second? That's time. Well, that just set up my equation for me, right? How far per time? So how far? 29 meters in time in 10 seconds. So she ran 29 meters in 10 seconds. Well, let's simplify that. What's 29 divided by 10? Well, when we divide by a base 10, why well, no, I just move a decimal point, right? So she traveled 2.9 meters per second. 
Very cool. Now for part B, this part that I was not going to forget. Part B. At this rate, how far can she run in one minute? Well, one minute is 60 seconds, right? So if she can run 2.9 meters in one second, and she's running for 60 seconds, I have to multiply 2.9 times 60. So let's see if I can do my math correctly. I know I've made mistakes in the past, and I know you've all caught me in my mistakes, and I really appreciate that. But I'm gonna try really hard not to make a mistake this time. Zero times nine is zero. Zero times two is zero. Placeholder. Six times nine is 54. Six times two is 12, plus five is 17. Zero, four, seven, one. We have one decimal place, so one decimal place. How far can she run in one minute? 174 meters is how far she can run in one minute. Awesome job. We just finished lesson 11's homework. How do we feel about this coordinate grid stuff and the review we did from past lessons? That was a good review. I liked that. If you need more practice plotting points, don't forget, I did put an extra practice worksheet on Canvas. It's a really fun plot the dot activity where you get to draw a picture using the coordinate plane and you get to even use colored pencils or markers or whatever you want to color it. It's super fun. So even if you don't feel like you need practice, it's great practice. So grab that worksheet and try that as well. Good job, you are now ready to do the R or the uh, check your understanding quiz. It's a real quick one today, so go ahead and jump on Canvas and do that quick quiz real fast. And as always, do your best because you deserve your best.